Seeing then this covenant being taken carries in it so great an obligation, it calls for great preparation before we take it. A slightness of spirit in taking this covenant must needs cause a slightness of spirit in keeping it. All solemn duties ought to have solemn preparations, and this, I think, as solemn as any. A Christian ought to set his heart, as far as he can through the strength of Christ, into a praying frame before he kneels down to prayer. And we ought to set our hearts in a promising frame before we stand up to make such mighty promises. Quote, Take heed how ye hear, unquote, is our Savior's admonition in the Gospel. Surely then we had need to take heed how we swear. Quote, Let a man examine himself, saith the Apostle Paul, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, unquote. Let him come examine to the sacrament. So I may say, quote, Let a man examine himself before he lift up his hand or write down his name, unquote. Let him come examine to the covenant. I shall briefly propose three heads of preparatory examination respecting our entrance into this covenant. First, examine your hearts and your lives, whether or no you are not pre-engaged in any covenant contrary to the tenor and conditions of this covenant. If any such upon inquiry be found, be sure you avoid it before you engage yourselves in this. A superinstitution in this kind is very dangerous. Every man must look to it that he takes his covenant corde vacante, with a heart emptied of all covenants which are inconsistent with this. For a man to covenant with Christ and his people for reformation, while he hath either taken a covenant with others or made a covenant in his own breast against it, is desperate wickedness. Or, if upon a self-search you find yourselves clear of any such engagements, yet search further. Every man, by nature, is a covenanter with hell, and with every sin he is at agreement. Be sure you revoke and cancel that covenant before you subscribe this. Quote, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. Unquote. That is, he will not regard my prayers, saith David. And if we regard, that is, excuse me, and if we regard iniquity in our hearts, the Lord will not hear us covenanting. That is, he will not regard our covenant. Woe be unto those who make this league with God and his people while they resolve to continue their league with sin which is, upon the matter, a league with Satan. God and Satan will never meet in one covenant. Quote, For what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Unquote. Second, before you enter into this covenant with God, consider of it and repent for this special sin, your former breaches and failings in God's covenant. Quote, we who were sometimes afar off, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. Unquote even so nigh as to be in the covenant of God. Some who pretend to this privilege will be found, quote, such as have counted the blood of the covenant to be an unholy thing, unquote. And where is the man that walketh so holily in this covenant as becomes him and, it, and as it requires? Labor, therefore, to have those breaches healed by a fresh sprinkling of the blood of Christ upon your consciences before you enter this covenant. If you put this new piece to an old garment, the rent will be made worse. If you put this new wine into old bottles, the bottles will break, and all your expected comforts will run out and be lost. If you should not feel and search your own hearts, without doubt, the Lord will. Quote, and if you be found as deceivers, you will bring a curse upon yourselves, and not a blessing. Unquote. This is a covenant of amity with God. Reconciliation must go before friendship. You can never make friendship till you have made peace, nor settle love, or hostility is unremoved. Third, inquire diligently at your own hearts whether they come up to the terms of this covenant. You must bid high for the honor of a covenanter, for a part in this privilege. Quote, Which of you, saith our Lord Christ to his hearers, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Unquote. We are met this day to lay the foundation of one tower and to pull up the foundation of another. We are pulling up the foundation of Babel's tower and we are laying the foundation for Zion's tower. We have seen some who have heretofore done as much, but they have done no more when they have laid a foundation for those noble works and taking a solemn oath and covenant, they have never moved a hand after either to build or to pull down unless it were quite cross to their own engagements for the pulling down of Zion's tower and the building of Babylon. And what was the reason of this stand or contrary motion? 
This surely was one. They did not gauge their own hearts beforehand, neither did they sit down to count the cost of such an undertaking. And therefore, when they perceived the charge to arise so high, they neither could finish nor would they endeavor it, but left the work before it looked above the ground, and are justly become a mock and a scorn and a reproach in Israel. These are the men that began in a solemn covenant to build, but could not finish. They had not stock enough, either of true honor or honesty, though their stock of parts and opportunities was sufficient to finish this work. Let us therefore sit down seriously, and count the cost, yea, and consider whether we be willing to be at the cost. To lead you on in this, my humble advice is that you would catechize your hearts upon the articles of this covenant. Put the question to your hearts, and let everyone say this unto himself. Am I indeed resolved sincerely, really, and constantly, through the grace of God, in my place and calling, to endeavor the preservation of the reformed religion in the Church of Scotland, the reformation of religion in the kingdoms of England and Ireland? Am I indeed resolved in the like manner, without respect of persons, to endeavor the extirpation of popery and prelacy? Am I indeed resolved never to be withdrawn or divided by whatsoever terror or persuasion from this blessed union and conjunction, whether to make defection to the contrary part, or to give myself to a detestable indifferency or neutrality in this cause of God? Am I indeed resolved to humble myself for my own sins and the sins of the kingdom, to amend myself and all in my power, to go before others in the example of a real reformation? According to these hints, propose the question upon every clause of this covenant, and then consider what the cost of performing all these may amount to, and whether you are willing to go to that cost. But it may be, some will say, what is this cost? I answer, the express letter of the covenant tells you of one cost which you must be constantly at, and that is sincere, real, and constant endeavor. Pains is a price. I am sure real pains is. The heathen said, quote, that their gods sold them all good things for labor, unquote. The good things of this covenant are sold at that rate. Yea, this is the price which the true God puts upon those things which he, which he freely gives. To consent to this covenant, to wish well to this covenant, to speak well of this covenant, come not up to the price. You must do these and you must do more. You must be doing, so the promise of every man for himself runs. I will, through the grace of God, endeavor. Yet every endeavor is not current money, payable as the price of this covenant. There must be a threefold stamp upon it, unless it bear the image and superscription of sincerity, real, reality, and constancy. It will not be accepted. For so the promise runs, quote, I will sincerely, really, and constantly endeavor. Unquote. Neither yet is this all. Such endeavors are virtually money. But as this covenant calls also for money formally, as the price of it, he that really endeavors after such ends as here are proposed must not only be at the cost of his pains, but also at the cost of his purse for the attainment of them. He must open his hand to give and to lend as well as to work and labor. Unless a man be free of his purse as well as of his pains, he bides not up to the demands of this covenant, nor pays up to this, uh, excuse me, to his own promise when he entered into it. Can that man be said really to endeavor the maintenance of a cause while he lets it starve, or to strengthen it while he keeps the sinews of it close, shut up? Would he have the chariot move swiftly, who only draws, but will not oil the wheels? Know then and consider it, that the cost you must be at is both in your labors and in your estates. The engagement runs to both these, and to more than both these. The covenant engages us not only to do, but to suffer. Not only to endeavor, but to endure. Such is the tenor of the sixth article, where every man promises for himself that he will not suffer himself to be withdrawn from this blessed union by any terrors. If not by any terror, then not by any losses, imprisonments, torments, no, nor by death, that king of terrors. You see, then, that the price of this covenant may be the price of blood, of liberty, and of life. Sit down and consider. Are you willing to be at this cost to build the tower? Through the goodness of God in ordering these great affairs, you may never come actually to pay down so much, happily not half so much, but except you resolve, if called and put to it by the real exige exigencies excuse me, of, the co of, the, of this cause, 
to pay down the utmost farthing. Your spirits are too narrow, and your hearts too low for the honor and tenor of this covenant. If any shall say these demands are very high, and the charge very great, but is a part in this covenant worth it? Will it quit cost to be at so great a charge? Wise men love to see, and have somewhat for their money. And when they see, they will not stick at any cost, so the considerations be valuable. For the answering and clearing of this, I shall pass to the second point, which holds forth the grounds of a covenant from those words of the text, quote, and because of all this, unquote. If anyone shall be troubled at the, quote, all this, unquote, in the price, I doubt not, but the, quote, all this, unquote, in the grounds will satisfy him. Because of all this, we make a sure covenant. Here observe, number one, a covenant must be grounded on reason. We must show the cause why. God often descends, but man is bound to give a reason of what he doeth. Some of God's actions are above reason, but none without reason. All our actions ought to be level with reason and with common reason, for it is a common act. That which men of all capacities are called to do should lie in the reach of every man's capacity. Observe, number two. A covenant must be grounded on weighty reason. There must be much light in the reason, as was showed before, but no lightness. Quote, because of all this, saith the text. Unquote. There were many things in it, and much weight in every one of them. And the reasons in their proportion must at least be as weighty as the conditions. Weighty conditions will never be balanced with light reasons. If a man ask a thousand pounds for a jewel, he is bound to demonstrate that his jewel is intrinsically worth so much else no wise man will come up to his demands. So when great things are demanded to be paid down by all who take part in this covenant, we are obliged to demonstrate and hold forth an equivalent of worth in the grounds and nature of it.